Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brett Glazer. I'm the manager for the MIA lab at Beach for Life in Denver. And today I'm going to have a short but important discussion on reprotoxicity and the effect that it can have on the developing embryos and ultimately our success in IVF. As you know, there are many uh, factors that are affecting success, the success that we have in IVF cycles. Um, too many to really speak about today, but we're going to focus on just a few, specifically those related to contact materials. Oil overlay briefly about uh, disposables, plastic disposables, not so much about media, but we put that into the same category. What we're going to really focus on is the effect that uh, reprotoxicity can have on the developing embryos. So the question that we ask is, how safe are our embryos? And what we know is we're exposing our embryos to an artificial stress by putting them in the in vitro system. And this stress is cumulative, having potentially negative effects, reducing the viability and the success of clinical outcomes. And what do we actually see the effect of this stress? We see reduced fertilization rates, impaired embryo development, reduced embryo implantation, and reduced ongoing pregnancy rate. And this is all fine and good to identify these, but the problem is by the time we've identified these, it's often too late and the effect of the reprotoxicity is already being implemented on these embryos and they're reducing the uh, clinical success and the potential for these embryos. So where does this toxicity come from? Now we're speaking specifically about contact materials. And when we talk about contact materials, we need to start with the raw materials that are typically used for media or for plastics even. And what we know is these uh, raw materials can often be contaminated or um, not 100% pure. There can be other compounds in there, and that's a, a source for this toxicity. Also, the stability of these components can be in question as well. Certain components can start breaking down over time um, and just inherently can be unstable, and that can lead to sources for uh, toxicity. The manufacturing process is also another area where we can start to see toxicity. Often, the manufacturing equipment isn't tested. Typically, it's uh, appropriate for media or, or contact uh, formula formulation or production, but that's an area that's just unknown, and we don't know what the contribution is. Um, through our own processes, we start to see how this can contribute to the negative effects. Um, the assembly and packaging process can often uh, lead to uh, variability, which can lead to toxicity as well, or at least it's a place where it can be introduced into the system. The sterilization process is always something to be concerned about, whether it's gas or a uh, energy or gamma or radiation that can break down raw materials and start to uh, express a toxicity, which is also something very important and something to be concerned with. So this concept of reprotoxicity isn't necessarily new. It's something that was identified or defined in 1987, and it's the negative effect of contact materials, including raw materials, on the viability and function of gametes and developing embryos. And from our experience, we see two types of uh, toxicity or expressed in two different ways. We'll see a complete degeneration of embryos, um, which is typically observed very early in the development of the embryos. And it can be an indication of extremely, extremely high levels of those toxicants. And this isn't typically what we see when we're uh, testing these raw materials or testing finished products. What we often see is the suboptimal development of embryos. And this is a little bit harder to detect and understand. We'll see abnormal uh, morphology, impaired development. And because of the way we perform our assays at Vitro Life, we'll start to see indications of decreased viability, uh, mainly in the, in the cell counts uh, of these blastocysts. We'll see uh, blastocysts that don't have the appropriate numbers of cells. And that's correlated to the viability there of the embryos. So, in order to detect uh, this toxicity, there's two bioassays that are primarily used, the sperm survival assay and the mouse embryo assay. Each one has positives, and unfortunately, each one has negatives. Um, and it really depends on the system and what you're trying to detect, whether or not you'll use one or the other. With the sperm survival assay, uh, one of the benefits is it's a human cell, um, which is good. It's, it's what we're doing is growing human embryos. Um, but it's looking at sperm motility, and that doesn't really give an indication of its potential to fertilize or create uh, embryos eventually if it was used for the insemination process. It's a good tool for uh, quality monitoring within the laboratory, 
especially when resources are limited. It's an inexpensive assay to use. Um, the problem, though, is it's sperm, and it's not indicating whether or not we would get true oocyte or uh, embryo development. The mouse embryo assay is an animal model. It's an in vitro, looking at in vitro development of embryos. And the sensitivity of this assay is dependent upon the design of the assay. So that's something that's very important to understand how these assays are developed. Typically, in the clinical setting, we're using a two-cell uh, mouse embryo and uh, typically using fortified media. So it's not terribly sensitive. Um, and there's ways that you can look at that. But in our hands, we're able to control this assay and increase the sensitivity by removing some of the factors that can help promote embryo development. Problem here is it's the mouse and not the human. So one of the criticisms is the clinical relevance of the, the assay. Do we see the same things in the mouse that we might see in the human embryos? So one of the problems uh, when talking about uh, the status of uh, materials and the quality is there's no industry standards for these bioassays that are used. Um, and, and it's really on the uh, responsibility of the manufacturers or, or the testing companies that are being used to uh, make sure that these tests are created in a sensitive way um, and that making sure that you control the variables uh, so ultimately, when you're looking at the end result, it's not a subjective analysis. It's more quantitative or at least related towards uh, something like viability rather than just morphology. We all know that because we have a blast doesn't mean it's a good viable blast. We've seen the beautiful blasts that don't implant, so something to be concerned about. The other concerning factor here is that not all material that's used in the ART process are quality tested using a bioassay. And if then becomes the end user's responsibility to verify that it's not toxic to um, cells using some sort of bioassay. Um, and in-house bioassays, as I've said earlier, have the potential to be a little too basic and potentially lack the sensitivity really required to detect low levels of toxicity, which can be added stress to the system. So in 2009, there was a very elegant paper put together looking at four years of observational data related to an IUI or an in, uh, in intrauterine insemination program and looking at the disposables that were used in that, uh, in that clinic. And the conclusion, we'll kind of start backwards and go to the conclusions right away. Um, what they identified is that some of these products release uh, molecules or components that can be reprotoxic to these human cells, the sperm and the egg. And this one, they specifically looked at sperm survival assays. But ultimately, their statement here, if I can just read it, if not detected before the introduction of these products, the, this reprotoxicity can lead to an immediate degeneration of the gametes or embryos, or could have a clear negative impact on the fertilization process and in vitro development of these uh, reproductive and embryonic cells. So clearly they're able to detect that there is a problem. Looking closer at the data in this study, 36 types of contact materials were tested. And overwhelmingly, 40% of those were found to be toxic. That's a little high for my lab. Um, I want to make sure that I'm using materials uh, in, the, in the lab, in the process, that are safe. When they break down the products into two specific groups, those products that are patient-related or uh, not touching uh, embryos or gametes versus the products that are used for gamete and embryo-related uh, procedures, we start to see a little bit of a difference, at least in this data set. 42% of those products uh, used for patient-related procedures were seen to be toxic. Now, simplifying that down, we see gloves, oocyte collection needles, the tubing, um, and embryo transfer catheters. That's a little bit concerning uh, because embryos are coming in contact with this material, and it's clearly um, clear by this data that there is a negative effect. With products related to the gametes, we see a little bit lower, or quite a bit lower, uh, rate of toxicity, but those are the lids of the sperm container, uh, culture dishes, and pasture pipettes. So things that are coming in immediate contact. And this is an indication that there are products in our industry that we are using that are still toxic. Uh, and that's a little bit concerning. Interesting, um, in this study, there was two uh, findings that I pulled out that I thought were interesting. They can detect lot-to-lot -lot differences within the same products. And this toxicity can be actually transferred from one item to the other. And the way they did that study is they utilized a known toxic glove and they touched an embryo transfer catheter that they knew was safe. 
and when they tested the embryo transfer catheter, it was then toxic. So there is a transfer, even though these aren't coming in direct contact, there is the potential for some of these other uh, materials to become potentially toxic. So of course we wanted to look at the products that were vitro life. We saw two product types that were tested, five assays were performed, and all of those assays ended with a passing result. And that's kind of an indication of where we stand as far as quality is concerned. One uh, very interesting topic right now in the literature is uh, the quality of mineral oil. And what's interesting about mineral oil is we need mineral oil to maintain the culturing conditions within our assays. And it's contacting uh, the, the media for extended periods of time. I think from this study what they've determined is there are toxic compounds within mineral oil. And from what we can uh, uh, extract from this study, there's no indication that it's a product from vitro life, of course. But this is something that is concerning. Um, and what's important as far as this study is concerned is, one, there are breakdown products in these raw materials, and it does have a detrimental effect on embryo development. And that's why it's imperative for uh, oil that's being supplied to this industry to be extensively tested with relevant bioassays. Another study that was interesting was an in indication that washing or post-consumer processing of this uh, oil can lead to better results. It suggests that you as embryologists need to take a product that you're paying a lot of money for and secondarily process that. And that, that's not something we want to waste our time and money on if we can get a good product supplied at highest quality level right away. Indicates, again, that materials are not safe or potentially not appropriately screened or tested. And there's a need for higher sensitivity testing by the manufacturers in this industry. So what's our experience? Um, not only are we a manufacturer of media, instruments, and consumables, but we also have internal quality testing labs. So um, we're a consumer of materials just like you are. Um, and this has led us down the path to start creating different products because we start to see quality differences that are available. And this is pulled from our data, internal data, over the last, say, 10 years. 25% of all the contact materials that come through our, our pre-screening lab fail. They're toxic. So, of course, we won't select them, nor will we sell them. When we look at the raw materials um, that are used in the manufacturing, kind of some scary statistics. When we look at mineral oil, now keep in mind, this isn't just the mineral oil we're selling. It's also mineral oil that we're screening for potential new suppliers, different types, different qualities. What we see is that three in five uh, lots fail mouse embryo assay. And that's a strong indication that there's a lot of variability in this raw material. Chemicals, we're talking about the base chemicals in the media. One in four lots there fail. When we're talking about plastics, now this is plastics that we're, we're externally sourcing uh, for our own use in the laboratory. We see one in four lots there failing. And with formulation vessels, even though these are pharmaceutical grade, sterile vessels meant for the, uh, really the, the formulation of uh, injectables, we see one in six lots there fail. Looking at some of the uh, consumable materials that we're actually using in the laboratory for processing embryos, serological pipettes, 25% of the lots that come through for testing fail MIA. Pipette tips, 40%. Um, uh, so we use a very specific type now, uh, and, and that's limited the amount of failing that we actually see. Denudation um, pipettes, this is old data, uh, back from the days when uh, plastic pipettes were used maybe 2005, 2006 in the laboratory when David Gardner ran the lab. Um, about 12% of those lots fail. And then culture dishes, 30% uh, of the lots fail MIA when they're processed for pre-screening. So this is an indication that there still is material available that's toxic to mouse embryos. We wanted to look and see if the situation was actually improving. So looking at the data for the Stericup filters is used in the formulation of small batches of media in the laboratory. Historically, prior to 2007, we saw a lower failing rate than we do in the present time, 2007 on. With conical tubes, it's the opposite um, effect. We see a reduction. So we can't really say that all plastics are getting better or worse, but there are changes within the industry over time. When we look specifically at some products that are available, we're often looking at toxins that we, we can't see. And this is an indication that there's also material or potentially um, debris or contamination within the dishes. And this comes from a, a plastic dish that's available on the market. 
and when we put media into the bottom of the wells and uh, centrifuge that media down, you start to see debris. And we wanted to look at and see what the actual effect was. Um, and if you had a rinsed versus non-rinsed, we start to see a statistical difference in the average number of cells that mouse embryos had during this assay. And that's an indication that the viability is increased when we rinse away this particulate. That's an indication that that particulate is actually causing some sort of toxic effect. So toxicity, even at low levels, has the potential to cause suboptimal embryo quality. And really what we're talking about is the reduce or reduction in the success that you can have clinically. So I leave it with a couple questions here. What are the clinical effects of this reprotoxicity? And what are you willing to accept in your own laboratory? And secondly, how can you minimize the effect of the reprotoxicity? And that's something that we should be concerned about because we need to go through uh, the process of selecting raw materials and make sure that we have the best quality materials with the most consistency possible so you can eliminate this as a variable from your assay. So a couple take-home messages. Toxicity can be detected, even at low levels, using a MIA or even using a uh, sperm survival assay. Not all materials are safe. And be selective when you're um, purchasing contact materials and consumables. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is limit the risk to the embryos. Thank you.